Good morning. Uh, our focus today is going to be on Nehemiah chapter 8. Uh, we covered chapter 6 last week. Uh, chapter 7 is another one of those chapters that is mostly a list of names. Uh, briefly here once again, though, I do want to describe a bit of what is, uh, what is recorded there. Uh, chapter 7 uh, begins with a mention that the gates were put up. Uh, Nehemiah puts his brother in charge of the city, an interesting note, uh, and chooses godly men to be in charge of the city's uh, security and operations. And then we get this long list of all the people who were recorded to have been living there in the city. You see, although the walls were rebuilt, much of the city was still a, a mess and, and full of rubble, and there weren't that many houses in the city. And so now the next step of the work would need to happen as the city itself is repaired and made truly habitable for the people once again. It's not so much that a great number of people needed to live there immediately, but in the event that uh, Judea was attacked, Jerusalem needed to be able to handle the people not just who live there year-round, but from the entire countryside who could come there to Jerusalem to stay in the event of an attack and a siege. So anyway, so that's why we have this list there recording who was living there at this time. And then here in chapter 8, after we get this list of who is there, we have this assembly as the people come together in an incredible way to read, to listen, and to respond to the word of God. So we're going to read there Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 1 through 18. When the seventh month came, and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people assembled as one man in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Beside him on his right stood Matthia, Shema, Ananiah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Masaiah. And on his left were Padiah, Mishael, Malchiah, Hashem, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Mushalom. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God. And all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Maseah, Kelata, Azariah, Jazabad, Hanan, and Peliah instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read it from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was being read. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is sacred to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people have been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is sacred to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for this is a sacred day. Do not grieve. Then all the people went away to eat and drink, and to send portions of food, and to celebrate with great joy because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. On the second day of the month, the heads of all the families, along with the priests and the Levites, gathered around Ezra the scribe to give attention to the words of the law. They found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded through Moses, that the Israelites were to live in booths during the feast of the seventh month, 
and that they should proclaim this word and spread it throughout their towns and in Jerusalem. Go out into the hill country and bring back branches from olive and wild olive trees and from myrtles, palms, and shade trees to make booths, as it is written. So the people went out and brought back branches and built themselves booths on their own roofs, in their courtyards, in the courts of the house of God, and in the square by the water gate, and the one by the gate of Ephraim. The whole company that had returned from exile built booths and lived in them. From the days of Joshua son of Nun until that day, the Israelites had not celebrated it like this, and their joy was very great. Day after day, from the first day to the last, Ezra read from the book of the law of God. They celebrated the feast for seven days, and on the eighth day, in accordance with the regulation, there was an assembly. Let's thank God for his word. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is truth. We thank you, Lord, that we can always trust you in your word, that your word not only shows us our sin and our desperate need for a Savior, but also, Lord, that you are that Savior, that you are the great and mighty and compassionate God who has lavished us with mercy and grace, who has chosen in accordance with your will to love us, to give us life, life in all its fullness, and all the joy that comes with belonging to you. May we know your joy today. May your word pierce our hearts. And may we be eager to obey you and honor you and live for you and in you this day. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Well, for the first time here in the book of Nehemiah, we are formally introduced to Ezra the scribe and priest who had led a group of Jews back to the land of Jerusalem many years before Nehemiah ever arrived. The book of Ezra, of course, describes in greater detail his focus and role, but what we find there is that Ezra was a man who was deeply committed to the word of God and to his calling as a priest to ensure the people of Israel knew and obeyed God's law. When he came to Jerusalem, he took many bold steps to call all the people to repentance and righteousness. He was clearly a highly respected man and priest uh, amongst all the people of Israel. And it and appears to have been, for all intents, the primary spiritual leader of the Jewish people at this time. We don't know exactly how much Nehemiah and Ezra's relationship had been built in these days. But based on their shared commitment to God's word and God's calling upon each of their lives, I would imagine that these two men really came to trust and appreciate one another. In fact, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, despite clearly being written by two different individuals from their own perspectives, were always recorded together on one scroll by the Hebrew people. The two books actually weren't ever recorded or printed separately until Christians did so in the Middle Ages. So clearly, God's work through the lives of Ezra and Nehemiah were always quite intertwined. Arguably, the spiritual commitment and climate needed for the people to commit to this challenging wall-building project as they did would not have been present when Nehemiah arrived if not for the work that the Lord had already done through Ezra. As such, it is quite fitting here that after the completion of the wall, the people would gather together in the city to listen to Ezra read the word of God. They had all just labored for the last couple of months building the walls of the city, and now they needed to, to, to know why the walls had truly been built to begin with. Recognize that this is well before the synagogue system had been formally established in Israel. So access to the word of God was no doubt very limited to select priests and scribes. It is likely that most of these people had never personally read the scriptures, and many had possibly only heard them read maybe only one or two other times in their lives, if at all. So this was a really big deal. The fact that this is happening also in the seventh month of the Jewish year is also important because the first day of the seventh month was called the Feast of Trumpets, a day when trumpets were blown throughout the land. And then the tenth day 
was the Day of Atonement, and on the 15th day, the Feast of Tabernacles began. An important point that becomes significant at the end of this chapter. Because you see, as, in, as important as Nehemiah and Ezra were to everything here, this chapter is actually all about the people and the people's collective response of obedience to the Lord. This wasn't just Ezra's doing. It was the people who assembled and the people who then faithfully responded to what God had laid out before them as Ezra read his word. And you see, church, what we have here is essentially what we would call today a revival. And revival happens as God's people commit together as a united community to repent, obey, and serve the Lord. You see, notice that these events didn't take place in the temple. Like we discussed last week, the temple was, wasn't likely ready for public worship just yet. This wasn't about where the people were, but what they were doing. Because revival is, is also always a response to the word of God. In fact, from this point forward in Judaism, the Torah, God's word, really became far more important than the temple. And likewise, for us as disciples of Christ today, it is the word of God, not any physical structure, that defines us, calls us, and equips us. As the Holy Spirit is at work in our midst, we trust the word of God, which our Lord and Savior has given to us. You see, the key to revival isn't asking the Holy Spirit to come and join us or to do something miraculous we haven't seen before. I assure you, church, the Holy Spirit is already here. He is with you right now, and He is at work in mighty and miraculous ways, whether you see it or recognize it or not. The key in all of this is our response to the Word of God as the people of God. And we find here that from daybreak, Essentially, as soon as there was enough light for Ezra to see the text, Ezra read the law to everyone who had the capacity to understand it. And he did so until noon. Scripture explains he was positioned on a large wooden platform built for the occasion with 13 other men who were uh, also priests who may have helped there with the reading. All of which simply shows that there was serious preparation and planning that went into this important occasion. But you know what I've always found the most impressive part of all of this? Is the note there at the end of verse 3, where it says, And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. People stood, stood outside, mind you, all morning long with their children and grandchildren and listened attentively to the reading of God's word. In fact, verse 6 demonstrates the clear respect they had for the word of God. When the book was opened, or more literally when the scroll was unrolled, the people stood up and Ezra praised the Lord. The people were celebrating the incredible blessing that God had elected to communicate his word to them. By saying, Amen, Amen, the people were declaring their submission to the authority of Scripture before they even knew it or even understood it. They knew it was God's word to them, and that was enough. Which is why they then bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. They knew the origin of these words, and thus obedience to them was not an option. They fully submitted themselves to the word of God because it is God's word. Likewise, church, we do not wait until after we hear God's word to decide whether or not we're going to be interested in honoring it. Once we know the God of the word, what other option, apart from humble obedience, could we ever seriously consider? We who know the awesome greatness of our God and the incredible love and grace he has lavished upon us, how could we ever compromise or waver our position and response to the word of our God? The reality, unfortunately, is that we have wavered and compromised at times, probably far more often than we care to admit. 
But what I want us to see here, though, is that when we ignore, disregard, or flat out disobey God's word, it is because we have failed to appropriately consider the God of the word. The only way for us to reject God's word is for us to ignore or foolishly elect to think little of the one who gave it to us. Thankfully, though, the people here in Nehemiah approach this day and this time with hearts ready for worship and eager to honor the Lord. This desire to honor their God is further seen in their desire to understand God's word. As scripture notes that the Levites were likely spread out throughout these people explaining to them what was being read to them. Some of this may have involved explaining Hebrew terms or expressions that the people may not have been as familiar with due to their exile in a foreign land, but I believe that this was more than just a matter of language. The Levites were helping ensure that the people knew the implication of God's commands for them in their lives. The Torah largely consists of a series of blessings and curses related to the people's obedience or disobedience. It was important the people understood what they needed to do and how the Lord had promised to respond. The issue, though, that verse 9 highlights is that the people were rightly coming to understand God's word. And as a result, they had begun to weep and mourn. For they recognized that it was because of the sin of their ancestors that they had been sent into exile. God's law had not been obeyed. God had not been considered appropriately by the people in the past. He had not been worshipped as he rightly should. And furthermore, there, there no doubt were several things that the Jews at this point right here were not doing that God had commanded them. And it broke their hearts that God's word had been neglected. Church, are our hearts broken when the word of God is neglected? ignored and disobeyed. It certainly had a profound effect on everyone gathered there in that square. But at this point, we find an interesting thing happening. We see that Nehemiah and Ezra and the priests and the Levites here interrupt the people because Nehemiah knew and understood that this day was actually an important day. It was the Feast of Trumpets, a day of celebration dedicated to the Lord. A day that we as Christians today know actually point to the victorious return of Christ. It was not a time of mourning, but a declaration of our triumphant Lord. Thus Nehemiah tells the people to go and celebrate, to eat and drink and feast and fellowship together, sharing their food with those who do not have anything prepared or to prepare. For you see, they didn't have to grieve. For as Nehemiah declares, the joy of of the Lord is your strength. This is one of the most famous quotes of Nehemiah, although many don't realize he was the one who actually said it. So what does this mean, that the joy of the Lord is our strength? As Christians, we like to talk a lot about joy and the joy of the Lord, but we often define the word joy itself and distinguish it from momentary happiness, which is a good thing, but we would be wise to recognize here that we aren't just talking about joy in a general sense, but we're talking about a very specific joy. Joy centered in the one true God. So if we want to know the joy of the Lord, then to put it plainly, we need to know what brings the Lord joy. What is pleasing to God? What does he celebrate? What does God get excited about? Thankfully, the Bible has a lot to say about this. His glory comes to mind first, as it makes sense that God's glory and God's joy would be intertwined. But beyond that, we find in God's word that our Lord rejoices when he defeats his enemies, when righteousness prevails by his mighty hand, when sinners are saved and people repent of their wickedness. We see our Lord rejoicing and showing mercy, compassion, love, and grace to us. We see joy in his triumph over sin and his glory in redeeming sinners and making them his own. 
We see the Lord full of joy when he blesses us with his holy holiness and has imparted us with his righteousness. You see, church, the joy of the Lord is not an emotional position or attitude that we need to work up in ourselves before we step out of that car in the church parking lot on Sunday mornings. But the joy of the Lord is the instinctive position of our heart and being when we truly and genuinely consider and recognize all that our Lord has done for us. You see, the people were mourning because through the word of God, they came to recognize all the areas where they as a people had failed their God. But Nehemiah here essentially calls them instead to recognize and consider that despite their failures, to realize all that the Lord had done for them. For it was the joy found in the Lord, who he is and what he had done, that would give them all the strength that they could need to obey. Likewise, church, no matter what we may be going through, what may be happening around us, or how many times we have personally fallen flat on our face and failed, the joy of the Lord is our strength. When we turn the focus off of ourselves in this world and back to where it belongs on the Lord, we find the joy we need to equip us to move forward in the grace of our God, celebrating Him with thankful hearts, even in the midst of this fallen world. See, church, this world is temporary. I remind you of that regularly. But we will rejoice in the victories of our God forever. And nothing, nothing can change that joy. Its origin cannot be stopped. Its culmination is guaranteed, and its source in our heart will never leave us nor forsake us. If you don't know what to do or where to turn, church, remember where our Lord finds joy and rejoice with Him. Align the joy of your heart with His and allow His joy to define your perspective and your energy and your obedience. You see, as verse 12 here describes the people's obedience and fellowship and celebration together, we find that they now truly understand the words that have been shared with them. And the words ultimately weren't about them. They were about God, His joy, and His power to take a foolish, idolatrous, and disobedient people, send them to a foreign land, protect them there, deliver them, and then fulfill all of his promises to them in spite of them, and all for the sake of his own name. What a joy it is to know the joy of the Lord in his redemptive grace towards us. Note here in verse 13 how eager the people were the following day to continue to obey the Lord and honor him. They understood there was more for them to do, that this was a special month of celebrating God and His grace, celebrating His joy and His victory. In fact, as believers, we understand that the seventh month of the Jewish calendar was really all pointing to, well, the Lord's return and what comes after that, and the culmination of the, you know, the marriage supper of the Lamb and our eternity in the presence of God. It's an incredibly prophetic month of festival and celebration on the Jewish calendar. And so these leaders here of all the families there in Judea came together on the second day to discuss and prepare how to continue. This wasn't because they didn't understand that the Feast of Tabernacles was coming, but because they all wanted to come together to ensure that they were fully faithful to the commands of the Lord. So when they read over the commands again to go and gather branches to make booths for all of them to live together in Jerusalem, they obeyed. The people went out, no doubt spending several days gathering all they needed to fully obey the Lord as one person gathered under one name. For as the end of verse 17 declares, their joy was very great. And such was their unity and joy in the Lord together that scripture explains here that the Israelites had not rejoiced in the Lord during the Feast of Tabernacles like this since the days of Joshua which realized was 
over a thousand years prior to this. It's not that the Israelites had not recognized the feast for that long, but they, that they truly hadn't all gathered as they were supposed to in this pure celebration of the Lord. You see, the Feast of Tabernacles was an incredible time in which all of Israel, every Hebrew, was to come and dwell in Jerusalem. The people lived together in booths, in the streets, and in the courts, and as mentioned here, even on the roofs of one another's houses. And while this time does reflect back and point to the time the Israelites spent living together in the desert during the ex Exodus, it, like the other feasts, don't just look back, they look forward, like I mentioned a moment ago, to that time when all of God's people will dwell together in the new Jerusalem before his glorious presence. And oh, what a day, oh, what a time that will be. You see, this, this was meant to be a joyous occasion, focused entirely on the joy of the Lord. And finally, finally, the people's hearts were united in the proper place. And they spent each day fellowshipping together and listening to Ezra read from the word of God. They were hungry to worship, hungry to celebrate their God, and hungry to hear and know and obey his word. What an incredible revival. Church, do you know the joy of the Lord today? Is his joy your joy? Is his joy your strength, your motivation, your desire and pleasure? You see, no community of believers will ever get very far or recognize and see the hand of God at work in their midst if they neglect the joy of the Lord. You know, like I was explaining earlier, the joy of the Lord isn't about just making sure you have a smile on your face when you walk into a worship service or a church or what have you. The joy of the Lord comes back to pleasing God, to finding joy in that which the Lord finds joy, to be excited about what God is excited about. You know, it is so easy for us to be concerned about so many other things, to get more excited about maybe who wins a sporting event or uh, what happens in some other area of our life than about who God is and what he is doing. But church, if we want to see revival in our own community, in our own congregation today, if we want to see the Lord do something absolutely incredible, then the, that focus of ours needs to be removed from ourselves and the things around us and turned entirely to Him. We need to allow our hearts to be excited about the things that God is excited about, for our joy to be submitted to His to celebrate all the awesomeness of God. You see, worship isn't just about following a ritual. Frankly, worship that is only a ritual isn't really worship. It's a routine. True worship is about humbling ourselves before the Lord and allowing His mercy and His grace to fill us with thankfulness and bless us with the life and the joy that only He can give us through his incredible redemptive work and the promises of his word. Do you know that joy today? The joy of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we cannot thank you enough for what you have done for us. We cannot be excited enough about the love that you have shown us and continue to show us, about your willingness to die for us, about your incredible promises regarding the day of your return and our future in your glory, all of us together, fellowshipping and united as one, full of praise and thanksgiving and joy in your presence. Lord, I pray today that we would eagerly look forward to that day when we will gather together in the new Jerusalem. Lord, when your joy in us will be complete and full and overflowing. I pray, Lord, though, that we would know that joy today, that we would submit our hearts, our minds, our focuses to you and to your joy, that we would allow your heart to supplant our own, 
for your purposes, your love, your grace, and your life to define our very attitudes this day. May we know your joy this morning. May your name be lifted up in and through our lives. Thank you, Jesus. May your name be blessed. Amen. Go in the grace and peace of Christ and walk in the joy of the Lord this week.